if you were to imagine yourself as someone who isn't familiar with Christianity, what ideas or beliefs would you consider strange about Christianity? We're going to look at the rest of Acts chapter 17 today. And I've entitled today's sermon as Strange Gospel. Acts 17, starting at verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day, with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this, is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching about the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your, ob your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. For one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him, and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think of the divine being as like gold or, or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Dam uh, Damaris, and a number of others. Now, what Paul says here probably isn't strange to any of us, since we've uh, we've heard these before. You know, we've had time to think about and come to understand the what's and why's and how's of Christianity. But for the people living in ancient Athens, Christianity was still a very new and unfamiliar religion. This is one of the main reasons why Christianity was uh, both offensive and attractive, depending on who you were and what your tastes were. So one day Paul is reasoning with the Jews and God-fearing Greeks in the synagogues, but also in the marketplace. Now Luke calls it a marketplace, but don't confuse it with something like uh, you know borough market, a place where you only do your shopping. This is more like a public square. Yes, it was a place where you could buy things, but it was also the center of public life. And there you could discuss different political and economic ideologies, you have public debates on philosophical topics, and really experience the cultural heart of the city. I mean, this was Athens, Greece. This was the context where a lot of classical people did their thing, like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. Um, in Athens, they had exquisite architecture and statues adorning the city square. And this was the place. This uh, this place was a symbol of great philosophical traditions and opinions. And there, in the city square, uh, a couple of different philosophical schools began to debate with Paul, but they're not understanding what Paul is saying. They think he's babbling on about um, some gods that they've never heard of, this uh, this Jesus, you know, Jesus, and apparently this other god named Anastasis, uh, which is the word meaning resurrection. 
And so they lead Paul to the court of the Areopagus. And this was a, a very highly respected institution that had the authority to deal in matters of religion and morals. So someone would end up here at the Areopagus if they were put on trial for some kind of religious or moral law-breaking. But it's also here that one could come to try to, um, to, try to become an approved or a, a licensed teacher of some philosophy or, 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 or religion. But Paul's not trying to be a licensed teacher. He's simply taking the opportunity to explain his teachings to the experts. Why does he do this? Well, they say to him, you are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. This is opportunity. It's an opportunity for Paul to talk about the gospel to people who were willing to listen. Now, Luke gives a, a bit of a cheeky explanation as to why this opportunity came about. And he kind of, he, he, he says that uh, all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there, uh, they spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. So this is just kind of a cheeky job at uh, the people there. In any case, um, that provided the opportunity for Paul to share this, this, this strange gospel with them. Now remember that these people are religious plural, plural, pluralists. They already worship so many gods. So to have someone else advocate for another god, you know, not a big deal. What's another god to worship amongst all the other gods? However, this god that Paul speaks about isn't like the gods uh, or the other gods that the people worshipped. And Paul starts right from the beginning. Verse 25, this God created the whole world, heaven and earth, and doesn't live in temples. Now generally, the worship of an idol, a God, would take place in a temple built to house that God. And this temple would be its home. And when you want to offer a sacrifice or give offerings, you would go into that God's home and do so on their altar. And inside these temples would be you know, the idol, the, 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 perhaps a statue. And the thing about the statue is that it's not just a picture or a symbol of the god. This statue would be the physical presence of that god. So if you looked at that idol, you were looking right at that god. And against all of that, Paul says, Yahweh God, this God, doesn't live in temples built by hands because there's nothing that can house God. And that's true. How can you contain the divine in a building? You can't. But wait a minute, you might be thinking, what about the temple in Jerusalem? You know, people would go there to meet with Yahweh, Yahweh God, is that any different? Well, the temple in Jerusalem was the designated location of Jewish worship, and you'd make your sacrifices and give your offerings to God there. But the temple was meant to be a temporary and practical solution to a problem. Now, if you go back to the beginning with Adam and Eve, was there anything like the Jerusalem temple there? No. Adam and Eve were able to talk with God anywhere in the garden. But then something happened. Sin. And that's what fundamentally changed our relationship with God and alienated us toward Him. Which meant that we couldn't enter God's presence easily. When Israel was a small family or extended family, worshipping God was achieved through the building of altars. By the time of the Exodus, something more practical was needed. A location for all Israel to be able to worship God. And that's where the tabernacle uh, came into play. And later on, when Israel settled in the land, this tabernacle was replaced by the temple. By the time Paul was teaching the Athenians, what had happened? Well, Jesus died on the cross and the veil of the temple opened up, which meant access 
into the presence of God. And that access could be anywhere now. That veil was gone, that, that separation between us and God. And so in Jesus' name, we could be in God's presence anywhere. Which is why you can meet God in your bedroom, in, your, in the car or train, at your school, at your workplace, in the library, at the shopping center, in the park. The temple was no longer needed because God restored the relationship between himself and humanity in Jesus Christ. So the temple wasn't meant to be permanent, but temporary. Now this idea of God not living in temples, it, it, it wasn't controversial. You know, some, um, some people in the ancient world uh, already recognized that no material could house the divine nature. So Paul starts off with something that's you know, not very controversial. What else? Well, Paul says he doesn't live in temples we build. In fact, God doesn't need anything from us. God accepts our service to him, but not because it's something that he is lacking or unable to do himself. He will gladly accept our worship to him, but he's certainly not dependent on it. Um, uh, he's not dependent on on us for it. How can the God who makes everything need anything from us? What can we give God that can possibly satisfy a need in Him? Because we don't give Him what He needs. He gives us what we need, life and breath and everything else, Paul says. So again, this idea has parallels in Greek philosophy, so it's not controversial. Again, so, so far so good. The people are listening, they're interested, it's something familiar to them. Uh, and then Paul goes on from that, that idea that God gives us life and breath. And he, is, uh, he says that he is the sovereign one who created the human race, the whole human race from one, uh, from a common ancestor. Now we're getting into a bit of strange territory. Because the belief among Greeks was that the Greeks were a superior race because they had, you know, a different origin story and they had rich culture and intellectual contributions to the world. So the Greeks were saw themselves very special. And to say that we all come from one common source, you know, Paul is in a sense, he's, he's kind of leveling the ground. He's saying, we're all created equal. We're equally valued equally wanted, equally loved. And no race can claim superiority over another. None is inferior to another. God directs all our paths, engineering appointed experiences and moments in our lives. And this is in order to lead each person to lead all of us toward Him, to make us realize how empty we are without a relationship with God and how each of us need God. And at this point, Paul now moves to talking about who, who we are in light of God. And Paul uses two quotations from Greek philosophers, Epimendes and Aratus. So, you know, don't think that Paul made up these, uh, these, these quotes. These are from Greek philosophers. Uh, Epimenides is the one who says, uh, in him we live and move and have our being. And uh, Aratus is the one who says, we are, uh, we are his offspring. Now each of these quotes, in their context, refers to, uh, to Zeus. However, when Paul uses it, he's not saying that Yahweh is Zeus. He's simply acknowledging that these quotes reveal some truth. And it's, 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 just a distorted truth about the wrong God, right? Where he says that we are his offspring, it's not in the sense that we are God-like, but in the biblical understanding of human beings, that we are made in his image. And so, if we are made in God's image, you know, look around, look at the people around you. People are not made of silver or gold or stone. Therefore, God can't be made of silver or gold or stone. Because that's a distortion of God and humanity, us. 
Now, I don't know whether what Paul has said so far has changed any minds. He's kind of talking about something familiar to the Greeks, but also uh, a little bit different. And I mean, it seems the, the Athenians are listening intently as you know, nobody's interrupting Paul or throwing tomatoes or heckling him for what he's saying. So maybe they're intrigued and they're open to what he's saying about God and especially about humanity. Because if what Paul says about humanity and God is true, it affects how we understand our lives and how we live our lives. Now Paul has made some big claims here. How does Paul know that these things are true? What proof does he have of his claims? And Paul's answer is this, that the supreme God has given proof of this to everyone by raising Jesus from the dead. And it's this point that causes the most disagreement. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. So I think most of what Paul says, you know, generally the, the people could go along with it. But once he mentions the resurrection, well, some people really didn't like that. Because to say that someone was raised from the dead, was resurrected from the dead, the implication of that is that if one was raised from the dead, then all will be raised from the dead. And that's that's part of the, the Christian theology of resurrection. We will be resurrected like Christ. And what the resurrection introduces is this idea where a relationship with God means a bodily resurrection. And this, I mean, remember this is ancient Greece. This is where um, the philosopher Plato taught about a separation of body and soul. And this idea of separation of body and soul has been ingrained in Greek philosophy and, and thought for you know, hundreds of years. What did Plato teach? He, he, he taught that the idea that truth is good. Truth is the thing that you want to hold on to and base your life around. Truth is what matters. Truth doesn't change. 2 plus 2 equals 4. That stays the same. It's true yesterday, it's true today, and it will be true tomorrow. So when you look at the human being, what doesn't change? Well, your essence, your soul, that, that, that thing that is you, that's who, that's who you really are, and that's what really matters. That's truth. But if you look at your body, what about your body? Yeah, that changes, doesn't it? Obviously, you know, it doesn't necessarily get better as it changes. We grow up, we grow out. As we get older, it keeps changing. You know, hair starts to go white, your eyesight diminishes, your bones and your joints get weaker, your back aches more, your organs might start breaking down. They don't work like they used to. And, and there's nothing you can really do about these changes. Maybe you can slow it down. But that's about it. Ultimately, the body is used and discarded. But the body, it's, it's, it's not as important as the soul. right? The soul is the thing that doesn't change. A soul will live forever. But the body, it won't. So when Paul preaches about a bodily resurrection, that means that there is value to our bodies. It means that we can't go around just doing whatever we want for our bodies. It means that we need to respect our own and other people's bodies. For the Greeks, this body is the shell that, that's just going to break down and die and get discarded. As a, uh, so a resurrection isn't good news. It's, it's, it's gross. It's offensive, you know. Why would I want this body again? I don't. But Paul can't get away from the resurrection. And as strange as it may be to some people, it's the crux of the Christian faith. You know, Paul characterizes the Christian faith 
as a faith about resurrection. Now, Paul takes his audience's context seriously, but he also tells these people something that blows their mind, something surprising, something potentially distasteful. The resurrected Jesus still has a body. A different kind of body, sure, but a body nonetheless. That needs to be our message as a gathered church and as a scattered church. That Jesus has been resurrected and so will we. Let me end with three quick thoughts about what this means to us. Firstly, it means that the body, our bodies, are sacred. God created us with bodies and Part of his redemption plan is to renew that body. His plan is to restore us in our humanness. And that's how he created us humans. Uh, fearfully and wonderfully made. The fact that he includes our physical bodies in his redemption plan means that that's an integrable, integral part of our created humanness. Our bodies are important and significant. And that's why God doesn't denigrate them. God dignified the physical body by, by becoming flesh and blood. And he did it again after Jesus died. When Jesus wasn't raised as a, you know, a, a ghost floating around, you know, scaring the disciples. He, Jesus had a body. So our bodies should be respected and honored. And it matters what we do to our bodies. And it's not just how you treat your own body, but how you treat other bodies. It matters that we don't objectify men and women in relationships or in advertisement. It matters what we communicate about physical appearances. It matters how we see and treat unborn babies. God created our physical bodies. Therefore, that relationship means our bodies are sacred. Second, it means bodily death is not to be feared. No. Plato was right to understand that the body does change and decays and eventually stops working. So, I mean, we can understand if the uh, Athenians don't think much about the body. You know, that's just how our bodies are right now. But life doesn't end on the day your heart stops. The book is not closed when the coffin is closed. Jesus' resurrection proves God is more powerful than death. He reversed death's effect and defeated death altogether. So as sad as death may be, as Christians we can look forward to more life after death. Life that is transformed and renewed and eternal. I remember during um, one of the chapel services in seminary, the uh, formidable J.I. Packer uh, was talking about, about death and the hope of resurrection. Right? And for us Christians, we have hope in death. And after speaking for a bit, he you know, very politely uh, wished us all there in chapel that day, he wished us all not only a happy birthday, whenever that would be, but also a happy death day when it comes. You wish us all a happy death day. Death is nothing to be feared. Because in Christ and because of Christ, we live. And thirdly, it means hope of newness. You know, the Athenians never considered that the body also goes through another change after death. Like Jesus, we get a new body. One that's suited not for this decaying world, but suited for the eternal world. Now, they just assume that when we, a resurrection means we get the same old body back. We do get our bodies back, but they will be different. Better. Unaffected by sin. Incorruptible. You know, this is... This is something that that can be quite fun to imagine. You know, what would what would our resurrected bodies be like? What does it mean to be incorruptible, unaffected by sin? 
know, those of us, of us with eye problems, you know, we won't need glasses anymore. I think we'll be able to see perfectly and perhaps maybe even more. You know, maybe, you know, with this, with this renewed and resurrected body, we might be able to see uh, maybe colors beyond the color spectrum uh, that we can't see at the moment. Can you imagine how cool that would be? And, you know, physical ailment, ailments, back problems, joint problems, sickness, disease, illness, you won't need to deal with those anymore because they won't be a problem anymore. All of that eradicated, gone, in the past, part of the old world. So there will still be continuity. This new body will still be you, but it will be a new you. You know, as strange as it might sound, our bodies are a big part of who we are and an important part of the gospel message. In this life, in our broken and failing bodies, we, we embody right now the resurrection message within us because we have the Spirit of Christ in us. And as we experience this body breaking down and failing at times, our message is we will have new bodies one day. Because we embody the resurrection message. Because we have the Spirit of Christ in us, who has risen in bodily form from the dead. And that's a strange and wonderful message to tell. Let's pray. Our resurrected God, we thank you that you have called us and to be your representatives in this world. And God, like Paul, I pray that you would give us those opportunities to be able to share who you are and how you are, what you mean to us, and what you've called us to be. I pray, God, that as strange as the resurrection might be to some people, that we would not shy away from it. Teach us to be confident in talking about the resurrection. Trusting, God, that whatever we say, however, however we might not say things that clearly or accurately, that you would somehow in our words, move and speak into our audience's ears and heart. God, using our words, you would make yourself real to others, showing them who you are. Lord, may everything we do and say be glorifying to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.